How's it going everyone? This is High Yield MCAT, and today we're going to be talking about Half-Life, a surprisingly broad concept and one that's going to be very high yield, but also relatively easy to learn for the MCAT. So let's get into what it is and what it can be applied to. So half time, or excuse me, half-life, of course, is the time it takes for one half of a concentration of a particular substance. And no, I don't exactly say radioactive isotope to disappear from our area of interest. So our first example is it can be an isotope, typically a radioactive isotope. One good example of this is carbon dating. So the radioactive 14 carbon can undergo beta decay. And if you don't remember what beta decay is, feel free to go back um, in the video linked below that covers radioactive decay and emits uh, a beta particle. Now the amount of carbon-14 that we see will allow us to know how old something that originally came, contained carbon is. Because the amount of carbon in the air in a certain period of history is constant. And carbon-14 has a particular half-life that can allow us to figure out how much carbon should be in something that was from a certain time period. Next, it can also be a hormone. So this is a little bit less intuitive and something you don't think about as much, but hormone concentrations circulate in our blood. So for example, a steroid horm hormone like cortisol, uh, being a steroid hormone, it has a particularly long half-life and takes a little bit longer to drop in concentration in our blood. So a half-life of cortisol is the time it takes for half of our original concentration of cortisol um, to exit the blood. Now our third example of a half-life can be a drug. So metabolizing and or clearing a drug from our system. So that can either be going through our liver or our kidneys and we're metabolizing that drug. Now as a general rule for the MCAT, half-life is gonna follow first order kinetics and we're not gonna really worry about too much else other than that. So let's take a look at what half-life looks like graphically. So if we draw, draw a basic x, y graph, on our y we'll have percentage and we'll start at 100 of whatever we're looking at. And on the x-axis we'll have time and we'll do time in half-lives. So half-lives. So at one half-life, we're gonna get half that 100%. We're simply gonna to go to 50%. So that's our first dot or our second dot, I suppose. And then in our second half-life, we are going to have that 50. So now we'll be at 25% of what we originally had. And in our third half-life, we are going to have 12.5%, etc. So we just keep on having all of those until we get really, really close to zero, but we never quite actually reach zero. Now some important equations to go over, or maybe not so important equations, but I think it helps to kind of know where they came from, are these particular equations. So let's write these out. Equations. So we have A is gonna be our concentration of some particular substance at a certain amount of time t and a0 is going to be the concentration of a particular substance at the very beginning and then to add to that for first order kinetics we have e to the negative kt and oftentimes you'll see k written as lambda those are basically just our rate constants for a first order reaction and as a reminder, for a first order reaction, our rate constant is going to have units of 1 over time, and that's usually 1 over seconds. Now, if we want to solve this for half-life, we can write out the equation this way, where k is going to be equivalent to our natural log of 2 divided by our half-life. And of course, we don't get 
a calculator on the MCAT so we can approximate this as 0 0.7 over our half-life. Now if that doesn't make sense, I'm going to derive this equation really quickly. So let's erase this graph and see how we got to this. So if we have our general equation, A is equivalent to our original concentration times e to the negative kt, and we need to solve specifically for half-life, we know that the concentration of A will be exactly half of concentration A0. So we write 1 half A0 in place of the concentration of A. And from there, we can see that we can cancel this A0 out now. And we're left with 1 half is equivalent to the e to the negative kt. From there, in order to solve something that has e to the negative kt, we can take the natural log of both sides. So the natural log of 1 half is equivalent to the natural log of e to the negative kt. And the natural log of e to the something is just that something. So we can write this as natural log of 1 half is equivalent to negative kt. Now if we're solving for k, we can divide by negative t. So we have natural log of 1 half to the negative t. And remember that in our log proofs, if there's a natural log or a log of a fraction, we can take the reciprocal of that, and then all we have to do to make that equivalent is put a negative sign out front. So we could write this as our reciprocal, 2 over 1, or just 2, put a negative sign out front. And we divide it by negative t. And of course, those negatives cancel out, so we get natural log of 2 over t. And that's how we derived this equation. So that's how those two equations are related. Now. I will say I don't think these equations are super high yield at the end of the day. I think it's much more important to be able to think about these things with some common sense when we're solving problems for the MCAT. So in that vein, let's take a look at a couple of problems. So here's a practice problem I derived from a double AMC problem. So feel free to pause the video, take your time, and try to solve the problem yourself. Alright, so I recommend solving the problem yourself first, but now let's get into what the correct answer is. So if we start with this first order kinetics, we know we're probably dealing with some sort of half-life problem here. And we are. We're given a half-life of 9 hours. So this t sub 1 half is a symbol for our half-life. And our original concentration, so our A sub naught, is 3,000 nanograms per liter. So in nano, you should know your SI prefixes is 10 to the negative ninth gram per liter, although that won't be very important for this specific problem. And now we have 18 hours as our time. So we could try to plug this into an equation, but I think it's a little bit easier to use our common sense and say, that two half-lives have passed in 18 hours if one half-life is nine hours. If that doesn't make sense, we can write it out a little bit more explicitly like this. So if we have one half-life per every nine hours, and then we multiply that by 18 hours, our hours cancel out and we end up with 18 over nine half-lives, which is just two half-lives. And if we know we have to half our original concentration every half-life, that means we have to have 3,000 nanograms per liter twice. So what we'll end up doing is number one, so this is our first half, 3,000 divided by two, and that's gonna be 1,500. And our second half, we can do 1,500 divided by two, and that should be 750. And those are things you should probably be able to do in your head. If that mental math is a little bit difficult, it's a sign that you should definitely put your calculator down and get down to working some practice problems and figuring out some of those mental shortcuts in your head. And I totally get the uh, frustration with having to relearn some of the math 
without a calculator, because a lot of us have been using a calculator for math since high school. Now let's move on to carbon dating. Carbon dating is an extremely common concept, but one that we often misunderstand. So in my own words, I put a little explanation of this. Basically, we use carbon dating to measure how old something is, and we use the ratio of C14 to C12 to estimate just how old that is, because we're going to be reducing this ratio over time. Interestingly, because the atmosphere produces the C14 radioisotope via photons bouncing off of nitrogen atoms and making this carbon-14 isotope, this carbon-14 is actually integrated into all plants and then all the animals that eat those plants. So most forms of life actually have a pretty constant uh, C14 to C12 ratio within their lifetimes. However, this does change with the passing of time. So we can date human remains or even archaeological remains using carbon dating. And the radioactive decay that carbon-14 undergoes, so carbon-14, so six protons, undergoes beta decay to make, oops, to make nitrogen, and we're emitting a beta particle. So that is beta decay, or beta negative decay. Now if that looks totally foreign to you, feel free to click the link in the upper right hand corner of the screen that explains radioactive decay for the MCAT. That being said, feel free to pause the video and try this practice problem on your own. So now that you've tried to solve this practice problem on your own, let's go through how we solve this problem. So number one, we want to know what our half-life is going to be. So we know just from the, our MCAT studying that the half-life is going to be at about 6,000 years. And it's helpful to know this number, but I'd wager it'd be given to you on the actual exam. So our half-life is 6,000 years approximately. If we want to be specific, it's 5,730 years. Now we also want to know what is our current concentration of carbon-14. And our de facto concentration is going to be 12,000 atoms. So we're not dealing with the concentration in molarity, but rather atoms in this case. Now we also want to know our time t, how much time has actually elapsed. Well, we're living in 2020 AD, so after the death of Christ. And we're going to add that to the 10,000 years before Christ. So we're at about approximately 12,000 years. If we wanted to be absolutely accurate, we would say 12,020. But for the MCAT, we're not given a calculator, so we're not expected to make those super accurate calculations. Now we could plug this into an equation. However, I think it makes more sense to use our common sense. So if 12,000 years have passed, and a half-life occurs every 6,000 years, that means that two half-lives have occurred. So two half-lives. And if we're left with 12,000 atoms after two half-lives, that means in order to get our original, we just need to take 12,000 and multiply it by two, two times. So number one, 12,000 times two equals 24,000. And number two, 24,000 times two is 48,000. So our answer is D, 48,000. That's it for High Yield MCAT. Feel free to like, subscribe, and leave a comment letting me know what topic you would like to see next. Also feel free to check out my free amino acid playlist that can be found in the link below.